This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. The following by remote transcription. Vern Grimsley is my in-studio guest. We'll be back with him in just one moment. About the Eastern religions, uh, do you find any that are particularly compatible? And if you do, again, feel free as far as time is concerned uh, to elaborate on that. Yes, Sikhism in particular, which is an amalgam of Hinduism and Orthodox Islam, founded by Guru Nanak in the 15th century, embodies some of the best of Hindu philosophy with the concept of a personal god the idea that God can be known, be experienced. Again, it's the experiential aspect of religion which is making some of its greatest appeal to young people. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument. And Sikhism is an example, as are some of the Hindu cults, some of the bhakti yoga cults of devotion or paths of devotion, which emphasize the fact that an individual human being can really experience something, not just find out about God, but find God, not just know about God, but know God in a personal sense. This has tremendous appeal to young people as I go out and do these broadcasts on campuses. The idea that it's experienceable. Somehow they can have an interchange of heart. They can, by faith, dare to believe they're infinitely valuable. That's a tremendous thing in itself. For a person to believe he or she is infinitely valuable as a child of God, regardless of that person's religious background, has to make a person's day different. One of the primary reasons, uh, I assume, but one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, most people have a religion uh, is because of the either the fear or the awareness or the awe of death. And what, if anything, lies beyond that? In the Christian religion, uh, the great promise is to someday go to heaven, wherever that is, and do whatever you're going to do when you get there. Uh, the old uh, Nordics uh, had Valhalla. Uh, Islam has paradise. Uh, what are the Eastern religions? What do they offer, if anything, beyond death? Many of them offer some form or another of nirvana or of a blending of the mortal consciousness with the supreme, the Atman, with the Brahman, for example, this great melding, and in some cases loss of identity, which in my conviction is not the case with survival after death. I think survival after death is going to be a great Star Trek, an adventure through the universe. I think the universe is in fact more a university as a place of learning, of challenge. If I were consigned to exist in what has been traditionally described as heaven, I would be bored to tears by the third day, sitting around on a cloud and strumming a polyethylene dulcimer or something of this nature and just singing songs. I want to learn. I want to do things. I think that's what afterlife is like. I think that just as a bee goes from flower to flower gathering nectar, we are destined one day to go from star to star gathering light. That's our spiritual destiny. This uh, would be for what purpose? For the purpose of growing, of becoming, of fulfilling our potentials. In my conviction, the Creator gave to each one of us a whole package of possibilities, which in our lifetimes we only begin to realize. William James said just before he died, he said, I'm only now getting fit to live. This paradoxical sense that as a person develops character, learning, wisdom, and all the rest, the idea that life is just a staircase to no place with no ultimate destiny seems somehow wrong to many, many philosophers. It certainly does to me. And that it, this process of growth, of learning to love God and love people better, the exploration of supreme values, truth and beauty and goodness, and the exploration of all of reality, in fact, cosmically, is the great adventure. Do you believe that in this there is an ultimate, there is an end, uh, there is a final ultimate purpose uh, for this uh, growth? And, and second part, uh, are you tying this to reincarnation? No, I'm not tying it to reincarnation. I do believe that it's an adventure throughout this universe that just as Jesus said in my father's house are many mansions, he was talking about plural areas to explore, that the uh, universe is not only a physical universe, but a spiritual universe. And it's a place of learning. And as I have to stress, the word adventure, adventure, the fact that it's going to be problems to solve, decisions to make, that it's not going to be all laid out neatly 
and succinctly. But the people are still going to have to grow and develop character. After all, the most magnificent achievement human beings acquire during their lifetimes on Earth, in my conviction, is character. Is the sort of rounded personality, the sort of loving wisdom. And I think it takes a whole universe career to begin to develop that. And people as children of a loving God, and I believe it's a friendly universe, people can begin to explore that and exult in that and have fun with it. I emphasize fun. I do think religion ought to be fun. Some people will talk about how they think their religion is going to make them happy in heaven, but they don't have a religion that makes them happy on earth. Or they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Or they're worried about where they're going to spend eternity and they don't know how to spend a rainy Saturday afternoon. I think mm -hmm. that it's, in fact, something that makes a relevant difference right down here on earth. All right. Vern Grimsley, my in-studio guest. Uh, we're talking on religion and philosophy this evening. He is director of the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. Good evening. You're on KTOK with Vern Grimsley. Uh, John, I have a, a, some qu a question for Vern. Uh, what I was going to say, Mr. Grimsley, I yes. rather hope that heaven isn't paved with gold because uh, uh, my eyes are sensitive to light, and I don't think I could stand all that glitter. <laughs> I wonder, really and truly, if... Uh, Heaven and or hell, uh, the difference between them is spiritual life or spiritual death. Union with God, complete union with Him, mind and soul, would be heaven. And separation from Him uh, and death would be hell. You know, you can have two people going to the same symphony concert, one person who's learned to love great classical music and another person who has not. And for one person, four hours of a symphony concert would be heaven, and for the person sitting right next to that individual, it might be extremely dull because of what they had learned to love. In my conviction, this is a spiritual universe, and the people who really learn to love spiritual things, truth and beauty and goodness, that's going to be the beginning of a spiritual awakening. And I do believe it's not only going to pervade the afterlife, but it's going to influence life on this planet here. We're well, I hope you're right about that, because there's certainly no figments in there. The inscription that was put on the cross by the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate was written in three languages, in Greek, in Latin, and in Hebrew or Aramaic. And mm -hmm. Greek was the language of culture and the arts. It's interesting, symbolically, Latin was the language of politics, of governmental power, and then, of course, Hebrew, the language of religion, and I think that eventually the teachings of Jesus, the love of God and people, will entirely suffuse all these areas of human life, that the culture, the art, the political power, all the rest are going to be dominated by the love of God. And I have a question for you, and I'll yes. state it, and then uh, I'll clear the line and let you answer after the last it. I'll listen to it every time of the yes. video. Uh, we know, at least uh, according to scripture, that when Christ was here, the, the, the God-man on earth, yes. that he reached out and physically touched people, and he touched them minds, he touched their spirits, he touched them physically. Yes. Where did we get off, and how did this evolve? That God is a something way off up in the sky somewhere that uh, is completely devoid of... Uh, any contact with human beings or, or their contact with him, but he's an entity that we're not supposed to be able or capable of understanding. Why is it that we're taught that uh, because we're finite and he's infinite that our spirit cannot one, reach out and One reason that we are taught that there's this great this gulf... Moment, I'm going to hang up and All right, certainly. One reason we're taught that there's this great gulf separating human beings from God is that that enables, in part, the employ of a professional class of religionists who are going to bridge that gulf for us. I think that's one of the key problems. That Jesus was saying, you yourself can know the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 21 is one of his great teachings. And it's found in corollary in every other world religion, too. And the Atman concept, the Zoroastrian concept of the Fravashi. Good evening, you're on KTOK with Vern Grimsley. Well, uh, yeah, uh, question. You know, if uh, we are so materialistic today, if uh, Christ came back today, uh, would uh, the materialistic people uh, be more apt to crucify him uh, much sooner than they did before? That's the question. The teachings of Christ are as different, as demanding, as challenging today in this culture as they were 2,000 years ago and that it would be tremendous tumult were there to be a literal second 
coming, particularly in a scientific age. And yet, the great hope that he was offering was that in a simple relationship of love with God and love with people, the world can be transformed. Abraham Lincoln was once asked why he had never joined any religious institution, and he replied, because he had never found one which required as its sole criterion for membership the two great commandments, love God and love people. In spite of all the theologizing and all the other theories, the isms and schisms which divide modern Christianity with something like over 400 different denominations now, the teachings of Jesus would ring in a very clear and simple sense, calling people to love God and love people. And that's so simple, again, that we want to complicate it, but I think that's what he'd be saying. And, uh... Really, I think uh, we were put here to uh, help each other, you know, uh, not uh, build uh, castles, uh, you know, uh, that will be here when we're not, you know. The only way out is up, in my conviction. We have to have a spiritual awakening. We have to have a new age of philosophy and religion, and I do believe it's coming, and it's coming through such vehicles, frankly, as this very sort of broadcast. The fact that we're talking about this sort of thing, and we're right, not content right. with the I, old I feel like that I'm going to have a heart attack, you know, saying these things, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't ever had the chance to say these things to so many people. So I would uh, gladly have a heart attack now uh, to be able to say these things, you know what I mean? Well, I, I hope you don't have a heart attack, but if people <laughs> ask how a spiritual renaissance is going to begin, I would advise somebody to go home, draw a chalk circle on the floor, and step inside that circle, and then pray, God send a spiritual renaissance inside this chalk circle. I think that's where it begins, that only transformed individuals can create a transformed world, only better men and women can fashion a better society, and only advanced citizens can architect an advanced civilization. Thank you. Okay, we're down to a minute and a half now. you got about one minute to ask your question. All right. Uh, in the Bible it says, go into your closet and pray and I will hear you. Uh, yes. why, uh, why does it take a multi-million dollar uh, building uh, and buildings all over the United States uh, for people to get uh, hurt in prayer? Some people like fancier closets than other people. Not only go I your, just want an answer. Yeah, I believe Jesus said not only go into your closet, but he said close the door. What he was saying was that you can have this personal relationship with God because it's so simple. Again, we've complicated what he was saying was the love of God and people, fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, kingdom of God within, quest for perfection, eternal life, live by supreme values, truth, beauty, and goodness, and this would be a tremendously different world. And the world one day will beat its swords into plowshares and its spears into pruning hooks and not learn the ways of war anymore. That's my hope, my prayer, and my conviction. On that, I have to leave you, ma'am. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080. Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something, simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.